Hey everybody, it's Jason Bly here, and I had a subscriber ask actually a pretty complex question uh, that I don't know that there is a clear answer to as far as uh, all the dietetics information, the scientific information, but I guess we should discuss it a little bit anyways. I'm going to flip it in here. He basically wants to know if since at least one medical doctor he knows of uh, says that eating a high protein diet can elevate IGF-1, and we know that IGF-1 is linked to cancer, at least in the bloodstream. I've done a whole video on that, by the way. Um, I might see if I can link it down below here for you guys. If I remember, I'm still waking up this morning. So let me put on my plus five hat of weapon smithing. Let's do a little crafting and let's talk about this. All right. Uh, first of all, I guess I'm going to define for you guys nutritionally what a high protein diet is because again, a lot of you guys are coming from the bodybuilding world and online fitness world and their ideas of high protein are not the same as medical doctors and nutritionists and even sports nutritionists. A high protein diet is usually going to be any diet to where your protein is 20% or more of your caloric intake. Now my general protein recommendations are going to put most of you guys, you know, depending upon how many calories you're eating and what you weigh, uh, in that probably 20 to 25% range. That's for gaining muscle mass. Now the 10 to 19% is considered a, a moderate or medium protein diet and anything under 10% is going to be considered a low protein diet. Now, uh, where this gets interesting, from a longevity perspective, meaning the culture that has the most people living to be over 100 years old, is a 9% protein diet. Uh, and that's the Okinawan diet. Which again, you, can, you guys can find lots of information on that out there, easy to find. Um, and one of the things I want to point out with that, I really hate it when people come in and misinterpret that data. Because a lot of times when you mention the Okinawan diet, and there's such a massive vegan following in the online fitness community, they'll jump in and talk about vegans. So I'm sorry guys, the Okinawan diet is not a vegan diet. They eat fish and pork. And they eat pretty fair amounts of it. They just eat about half of the amount that people eat in the rest of Japan. All right, but they're still eating pork and fish regularly several times a week. So you got red meat and you got fish because pork is considered to be a red meat nutritionally. So let's not pretend they're on a vegan diet and they do eat a little bit of eggs, uh, things like that. And they eat some birds, pheasants, uh, chickens, all of that. It's still there. This is not a vegan diet and they're the longest lived people on earth. However, it is relatively low in meat and all the meats that they are eating are lean. They're not eating the marble factory farm meat that we're eating over here. Uh, but their diet is very, very high in plants, starches, pretty low in sugar, but it is tons of starches and it is ultra low fat because everything they're eating is lean. I think their diet is somewhere between three and six percent dietary fat. So that's pretty low, about as low as you could possibly be. Uh, they have the most people in the world per capita that live to be over a hundred. Now, interestingly enough, uh, I'm going to link down below a little National Geographic write-up of some of the stuff so people can grasp it. This gets complicated because there's more than just your protein intake to consider when it comes to IGF-1 and cancer and everything else. Yeah, there has been some data over the years that suggested that people on a high protein diet, I think ranging from the ages of about 50 up through 64, uh, seem to have higher rates of cancer and higher rates of cancer death. And there's that seems to be pretty well documented by the WHO, the World Health Organization around the world. So a lot of people are jumping to that, hey, it must be the IGF-1, and it's possible it could be contributing tremendously through that age range. Uh, very well could be a factor, but it doesn't mean that that's the only thing going on there. There could also be other dietary things going on. Meaning, uh, what we notice in the United States, the more affluent you are as a nation, oftentimes the more processed and refined foods you eat, the more table sugar, uh, the more highly marbled meat. Well, that combination is a terrible combination. Again, eating a diet pretty hefty in fructose combined with a diet pretty high in saturated fat, probably not the best option for people who want to live a long time. Bad combination. Well, more fluid countries tend to have more of both of those things. Not a good combo. Um, so there could be the fact that a lot of them are on a higher protein diet, aren't necessarily eating all lean proteins, large amount of saturated fat with other refined foods not a good combination so that could be a big factor too uh, also the fact that people on a higher protein diet in most countries at least are also more wealthy they have better income which also tends to lead to them being more sedentary being sedentary 
<clears throat> increases your chances of cancer, diabetes, uh, cardiovascular disease, everything else. So there are other factors there, and I'm not saying uh, the IGF-1 and the being produced from the diet might not be a factor because it very well could be, and it very possibly is, very probably is. But there are going to be a host of other factors involved. You don't ever just take something like that in a demographic and say, oh, the correlation is automatically the causation. In this case, it's probably a contributing factor, one of several. So you have to consider that. Well, where it gets interesting is that we find the, uh, the statistics shift around when people reach 65 and older. And it's that people on a high protein diet who are 65 and older tend to have better longevity. They have lower mortality rates. Well, what's going on there? Well, I think that's pretty obvious. A uh, higher protein diet, when you reach 65 and up, tends to preserve muscle mass a little better. What do we know having more muscle mass does from various studies on weightlifting and stuff? Well, people who lift weights have more muscle mass. They tend to have cancer at 50% of the normal rate. Again, has to do with the way the body processes insulin. That can affect IGF-1 in the bloodstream, insulin in the bloodstream. You have better insulin sensitivity if you have more muscle tissue. Uh, more muscle tissue causes, again, lower heart attacks, lower stroke rates, much lower diabetes rates, and particularly uh, lower osteoporosis rates. Now, they might not get that from the protein here, but you guys get the idea. The other stuff, yeah, it could be contributing to preserving muscle tissue better. And having more muscle tissue, again, reduces a lot of the factors there. Uh, you're stronger. You're less likely to get all these various hip fractures. You're less likely to have a lot of these other diseases and a lot of these other diseases like diabetes tends to have secondary issues it tends to cause uh, lower mortality rates and a lot of these uh, diseases also can force you to become sedentary because of various problems or more sedentary less active so having more muscle mass seems to offset uh, a lot of the risks that they're talking about with the elevated IGF-1 once you reach that age because at that age uh, muscle atrophy, muscle de degeneration of your body starts to contribute tremendously to getting these other various ailments that can uh, kill you sooner or in a very, at the very least reduce quality of life. So we're dealing with the different ages, different factors could be offsetting other factors in terms of uh, your longevity, cancer rates, everything else. So it's really interesting because there's a lot of variables at play here. And uh, again, I think people are going to remember that just recently there was a study that came out that showed uh, no negative blood work, anything else from people on what we call a very high protein diet uh, in healthy young people who consumed it for a year. Now that's interesting because that means that some of the risks are overrated. Uh, again, they didn't see concerns in the blood markers. They're cholesterol was okay. It didn't affect cholesterol negatively. We didn't see kidney damage, any of that stuff. But uh, the thing to consider is that a one-year study on healthy young people is not always going to be reflective of what's going to happen in old age. But it was interesting to note that it did throw out the idea that uh, higher protein diets are going to damage your kidneys. Uh, not necessarily the case. The reason you see so many bodybuilders with kidney damage uh, could be a number of factors going on. Number one, the diuretics many of them use pre-contest. Right there at contest time, diuretics can damage your kidneys. Combine that with maybe the ultra-high protein diets many follow with the ultra-high uh, training regimens, which tends to put blood, or sorry, uh, protein into your urine and things from excessive amounts of training. Uh, because we could see some strain on the kidneys from the ultra high protein diet, but not enough to actually damage them on their own. Maybe you combine that with excessive amounts of training that some bodybuilders and other people do, uh, then the diuretics being another factor. And yeah, you could see some extra strain on the kidneys from all of that, but it's not going to be from the protein intake alone for people who don't have kidney damage. You got to remember all the data we have on, uh, needing lower protein diets for people with kidney damage or missing a kidney, they don't have healthy kidneys already. So the little bit of extra strain that a high protein diet could cause uh, could be a problem for those people, but that's different than someone who has two normal healthy functioning kidneys. So you've got to keep that in mind when we're talking about these things. Just like I can say to you guys, we know that fructose intake, when it becomes excessive, about 50 grams a day chronically, starts to really negatively affect your health. But that doesn't mean fructose automatically does. 
your body has an acceptable amount that you can consume every day, which is, you know, under 50 grams of fructose a day, that doesn't seem to really negatively affect your health even though the substance itself can be problematic for the body and it has, it has to deal with it a little bit and your liver has to deal with it and puts a little bit of a strain on it, but not enough to cause you any problems uh, with your health. So again, you've got to remember the thing is with everything, the, that can have negative effects on the body doesn't mean that it automatically does when it's at an acceptable level. It's just that when they become unacceptable or there's other health problems and you push certain things in your body to an unacceptable level, they can be a problem. Like again, high protein for people who have kidney problems, that little bit of strain on the kidneys, their, their body can't necessarily handle that little bit of strain. Everyone else can just fine. Your body's used to strain. Your body's used to a little toxicity. It has reasonable limits of things it can handle for 100 years. Just don't exceed those limits. But uh, as far as the protein intake goes, yeah, it could be a potential concern in certain age groups, at least according to the data that we have. But in other age groups, it can, seems to have actual positive benefits for longevity. So there's no clear cut answer. There's no clear consensus here. And this idea that a high protein diet is, is going to put everyone at a higher risk of cancer. Uh, again, you've got to remember there's other factors in, in play there. Just like you notice with the 65 plus group, it seems to reduce mortality rates from a lot of diseases. But the thing you've got to remember with the cancer is most of the people listening here are the lowest risk group for cancers anyways. Most of you follow a healthy diet. Of some nature, you probably eat plenty of vegetables and stuff because you watch fitness channels regularly. Uh, you're watching a lifting channel now. So the person asking the question probably lifts weights. Well, we know that lifting weights and getting a decent amount of fiber and vegetables in your diet are two of the best things you can do to lower your cancer rates anyways. So as long as you're not sitting around consuming excessive amounts of protein, I really wouldn't worry about it that much for your cancer uh, because you're, you have other lifestyle factors that we know have tremendously positive impacts on lowering cancer anyways. Again, if you're watching a channel like this, so for you, you should be the least worried of anybody out there about cancer as long as you're not painting IGF-1 or insulin and maybe you're not trying to do something crazy like a 400 or 500 gram of protein a day diet. If you're staying in the protein ranges, I usually recommend to gain muscle mass, which is 1 gram to 1.6 grams per kilogram of body weight, which again for a guy my size, you know, it's going to be, I, I probably eat about 150 grams a day, maybe, maybe a bit more. It varies from day to day. But um, if you stay in those recommendations and you're lifting weights and you eat plenty of green stuff, your odds of getting cancer are dramatically lower than most other demographics out there anyways. And cancer probably shouldn't be a big concern for you. Could you get it? Sure, you could get it. But you've already stacked the odds pretty heavy in your favor to not do so. So overall, I wouldn't worry about it much because lifting weights and getting enough vegetables in your diet are probably the two biggest factors already at play anyways and again not smoking cigarettes all of that so probably not a massive concern for most of you out there all right guys well that's really all i have to say on that today i hope it's been informative and i will talk to you guys next time